And now before we pray for our country and for the church, I invite you to pray for Evelyn Ortel, a longtime member of this parish who lies in that thin space between this world and the next. If you will hold Evelyn and her daughter Judy Singley and their whole family in your prayers. And also pray for Julie Van Steenwick, whose father John, died yesterday. John and Julie's family have been members of the parish for decades. And it's part of our joy and our responsibility as members of this community to continue to hold them in our prayers. And finally, I'd like us to pray for the church, for our country and for its leaders. And these prayers you can find in the Book of Common Prayer on page, pages 818 and page 820. For the church. <clears throat> o God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our only Savior, the Prince of Peace, give us grace seriously 
to lay to heart the great dangers we are in by our unhappy divisions. Take away all hatred and prejudice and whatever else may hinder us from godly union and concord, that as there is but one body and one spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, so we may be all of one heart and of one soul, united in one holy bond of truth and peace, of faith and charity, and may with one mind and one mouth glorify you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For our country. Almighty God, who has given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly pray that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of your favor and glad to do your will. Bless our land with honorable industry sound learning and care for the common good. Save us from violence, discord and confusion, from pride and arrogance and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people, the multitudes who have come here out of many kindreds and tongues and do with the spirit of wisdom those to whom we entrust the authority of government, that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to your law, we may show forth your praise among the nations of the earth. In the time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, do not allow our faith in you to fail all of which we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And this one is for the President of the United States and all in civil authority. O Lord, our governor, whose glory is in all the world, we commend this nation to your merciful care that being guided by your providence, we may dwell secure in your peace. Grant to the President of the United States, members of Congress, the mayor of this city, and to all in authority, wisdom and strength to know and do your will. Fill them with the love of truth and righteousness and make them ever mindful of their calling to serve this people in your fear through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he had locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Good morning. 
This Sunday is the feast of the baptism of our Lord. And Sarah just read the version from the Gospel of Mark. And what I'm about to talk about actually has everything to do with baptism. But it might make you uncomfortable and it might not sound like it's about baptism. But you see, baptism was about being cleansed from your sins in a symbolic ritual for John where you are, you have a symbolic cleansing of your sins. You turn away from them, you're cleansed from them. In our baptism now, we take that metaphor of cleansing further and we are baptized into Jesus's death and come up out of the water um, new. We're baptized into his death and into his life. But in order to be cleansed from your sins, you have to see them. In order to repent, you have to know what you're turning away from. And I have a hunch that the deep brokenness inside of us, inside of each one of us, has been growing silently like a sickness from the beginning of time. Our Catholic friends would call this original sin and while I don't agree with the whole doctrine of it and where it came from and what it means, the truth of human nature, of our capacity to lie and to swallow them when it suits our self-interest and lust for power and attention that truth is present in the story of the garden. It's present in the founding of our country. It's present in each one of us. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Perhaps like you, I've had a hard time sleeping since Wednesday. I close my eyes and I see those images the crowd literally breaking down the doors to get in. The man with his feet up on Nancy Pelosi's desk. The gallows. The man with the zip ties. I can't get those images out of my head. And a little part of me has in the last few days said, how could this happen? Because it's not who we are. But that's exactly who we are. And we did let this happen. You know, I hadn't really thought very much until recently about why the foundational myth of humankind about how we were separated from our best selves, the story of Adam and Eve and the serpent in the garden. I hadn't, I hadn't given much thought to why that foundational story of our brokenness is about deceitfulness. It had never occurred to me about why deceitfulness and our own lust for power is it the core of human brokenness? What our Catholic brothers and sisters would call original sin. I hadn't really thought of it until I saw its fruits on Wednesday. I saw its fruits laid out in a way that was so obvious, there was no longer any way to deny it. There was a lie, one of the lies, one of the many lies that made Wednesday possible was the lie about the election. That lie and a version of it, like a poison gas had been seeping under the doors and through the cracks in the windows in our, in our own psyches for years. 
Many of us would breathe in that poison and cough it out, knowing it not to be true. But others breathed it in, like Adam and Eve in the story. They breathed in poison because it served their purpose. They would be like God. Our capacity to fool ourselves, our capacity to lie to ourselves in order to serve our own purposes is almost bottomless. When we don't breathe in deeply that particular poison, we don't understand why others don't smell it for what it is, the stench of the lie. But we breathe in our own. How did this happen? Because we've become a country with an enormous lie at our foundation. And even those of us who smelled the stench of this lie have a cancer growing in us, have a poison in us, and we've been corrupted by it. That lie was whispered in the ears of our ancestors to tell us that people whose skin is brown or black were somehow lesser than we were, people with white, pink skin. That lie, that lie, which should have struck us as outrageous, as we should have coughed that right out and thrown open the doors and let the fresh air in, but it suited our purposes. This was a country that needed free labor. This was a country that needed to believe that half the human population was lesser than. We believed it for our own greed. We believed it for our own psychological needs to other someone in order to exploit them. We believed it so hard and our entire country, not just the economy, but our governmental institutions, our roads, our buildings were built on the backs of that lie. Over time, the lies intensified we had to continue to make up lies in order to keep the bile down, to continue to fool ourselves. And the poison put good people to sleep so that they wouldn't see it. Those lies morphed into things like, my family didn't own slaves. For too long, this poison, this willingness to believe lies when they suited us, kept us from seeing what was right in front of us, kept us from believing that what our brothers and sisters of color were telling us about our institutions about our unconscious beliefs. We, we didn't believe it, we couldn't see it. We couldn't see it because we didn't wanna see it. We didn't wanna see it because it was ugly. We didn't wanna see it because it hurt our own self image. We didn't wanna see it because it felt too much to fix. And so we allowed generation upon generation of people to suffer under the weight of this lie. 
our willingness to overlook this original sin of, a, of America has helped lead us to a place where white supremacists called on by the president carried the Confederate flag into the Capitol and hung gallows outside. As part of the work our vestry is doing to inform ourselves about systemic racism so that we can repent and wash ourselves clean of this stench. We watched a short film about a group of Episcopal clergy who went to South Africa to some of the um, sites where their ancestors had been enslaved and put on ships and sent to this country and elsewhere. And one of the um, featured people in the film was a woman named Stephanie Spellers, who is an Episcopal priest and she works uh, directly for the presiding bishop. And she had brought with her an amulet that had belonged to her grandmother and her grandmother was the daughter of um, people who had been enslaved. And this amulet Stephanie brought with her as a tangible talisman of that time when her family had been enslaved and when her ancestors had come from a place like that. And she brought it with her and her presence there was such a sign of resilience, such a sign of truth and justice and righteousness breaking through a lie. The tangible sign of the doors being thrown open. And she brought that amulet with her and she waded in to the waters, the very waters that had held ships that took her ancestors to slavery. And she washed that amulet in the waters. And she said it felt like a baptism. My friends, we cannot be cleansed of our sins. We cannot put this behind us until we see it and name it and repent. For too long, the church has been afraid to offend. One of the church's original sins was preaching slavery, preaching the idea of white supremacy as God's chosen race, those lies have poisoned and killed millions of people. And it is time for us to call them what they are, lies. The church has been so afraid of offending. We've been scared off by not wanting to preach politics in the pulpit, but believe me, by not naming the sin of racism or the lies of this president. We have brought politics into the pulpit, but they are the politics of silence. They are the politics of complicity. They are the politics of fear. In order for the church to help people remove this spiritual sickness, we must tell the truth. The truth will set us free. Naming the demons is the first part of getting rid of them and casting them out. We have been afraid. Wednesday was caused by the lies of a president and the complicity of Congress that went along with it. 
people were killed. Our institutions have been shaken and cracked, if not broken. The church has a duty to name this spiritual sickness. It is in our foundational story of humanity. Our ability to take in lies when it suits us, when it suits our narrow need for power and attention, our capacity for violence, our capacity for hatred. It's all there. It's a spiritual sickness. And the first step in healing is to name the truth. And then we desire to repent. Our baptismal vows call us to renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness. Those things are real. We modern people tend to sniff our noses at that as if it was just something from the past. But even my rector at St. Albans used to say, the spiritual forces of darkness are real and we know that because they're so hard to resist. We take vows in our baptism. We take vows to renounce those spiritual forces, those sinful desires that draw us from the love of God. We take vows in our baptism to respect the dignity of every human being. And I call us to return to those, to renounce the forces of division and lies and hatred and racism that draw us apart. To renounce the desire to just keep ourselves calm and comforted and the desire to put our own comfort ahead of the well-being of those that our culture has marginalized and oppressed for centuries. I call us to repent of our desire to accept lies when they suit our power, our purposes, our financial gain, and to do as God calls us, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to seek the common good, to look at the fruits of our actions, to love one another not necessarily with our emotions, but with our actions. We will be called in the days ahead to truth telling, to the hard work of rebuilding trust, bonds, relationships, institutions. But this time we need to do it on a bedrock of truth on a bedrock of courage, on a bedrock of conviction that God is in this with us, but that in order to work with God, we have to align ourselves with God's will and not our own. So we need to wade in those waters of baptism. We need to be cleansed from this stench that covers us The truth will set us free. Amen.
what's with